Welcome to the Sports Ethicist Show, coming to you from the basement of Burpee on the campus of Rockford College in Sportstown, USA, Rockford, Illinois. I am Sean Klein, the sports ethicist and philosophy professor at Rockford College. The Sports Ethicist Show discusses the many ethical and philosophical issues that arise in and around sport. You can read the Sports Ethicist blog at sportsethicist.com, where you can also download podcasts of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, or find links to related information. The Sports Ethicist is also on Facebook and Twitter. Joining me today is Sean Beckman, Assistant Professor of Biology at Rockford College. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thank you, Sean. So you got two Seans here. So. <laughs> uh, now you are teaching this semester uh, a course called Biology of Sports and Exercise. So I thought that that would be a good jumping point uh, off to start our discussion and talk about the issue of fitness. So what is fitness? What does it mean to be fit? Well, fitness is really, I mean, yeah, we can say someone's physically fit, but what that means is, I don't want to say subjective, but it varies from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I would consider a normal average person being physically fit and being healthy for the most part, you know, and being able to maybe go out and do a little running, do a little exercising without getting horrendously winded versus mm -hmm. what I expect an elite athlete to be fitness wise varies. And certainly, you know, you look at someone who's, you know, 325 pounds and they're lined up on the football field. Yeah, that person may be fit. But if I saw an average individual on the street who was 325 pounds, there's very little chance I'm going to tell you that person's fit. Right. And when you think about the lineman and, you know, him being 300 pounds, and then being able to move the way those linemen move at the speed that they move. I mean, they don't look fast compared to, um, you know, the running back or the wide receiver. <laughs> they might look fast compared to Tom Brady, but they don't look fast. <laughs> and I can say that as a Patriots fan. But uh, they, um, you know, but the linemen, they, they're able to move. I mean, they, so, I mean, there is a sense of, of athleticism there, which, oh, is, yeah. which is another related concept here. So we have fitness, health, and athleticism, which... They overlap in various ways, and so they're, they're worth peeling apart a little bit. Certainly. I mean, I think if there was one thing that you wanted to do to try to quantify fitness or say if someone is fit, and again, very hard to do, but maybe looking at cardiovascular health. Okay. And, you know, an average person walking down the street at 325 pounds, you know, as much as the average that is, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, more and more so this day, this might be becoming the average, um, but that person's cardiovascular health is going to be nowhere near what a 325-pound lineman's cardiovascular health is. You know, heart rate's going to be higher. Blood pressure's going to be higher. You can be sure that once they get moving and start running, an average person's heart rate is going to increase a lot more quickly, and the blood pressure is going to go up with it. Versus a lineman, yeah, those guys get winded relatively quickly, but compared to an average human being on the street at yeah. the same weight, they're gonna, their cardiovascular health is going to be a heck of a lot better. Okay. And so if you had to ask me something to quantify for what qualifies as fitness, that would probably be it. So looking at cardiovascular health, and so I, I take it, you know, I'm you know, not an not a, uh, expert on, on biology, health, exercise, um, but I, in terms of having poor cardiovascular health, uh, or rather, let me put it this way, the, 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 the characteristics you just described, higher blood pressure, uh, faster heart rate, uh, longer time to come down from, mm -hmm. from the increased heart rate. What are the, that's what we characterize as poor cardiovascular health, correct? Certainly. certainly. Now, uh, why, why, what's the dangers, I guess? Sure. Um, you know, your heart's a muscle as yeah. much as anything else in your body is a muscle. And you've got to realize that muscle is contracting and beating and pushing things through it as many times a minute as your heart rate is. So it's working, and it's working a lot. And the more you're making it work when you're normally at rest or the harder you're making it work is going to be worse for it long term. You realize, average person, that thing is pumping you know, 60 to 80 times a minute every minute for 80 years. You yeah. hope. <laughs> you hope. Yeah. How far you push that beyond that, yeah. you know, could potentially be dangerous. Now, add into that the concept of blood pressure. I mean, effectively, when we're talking about blood pressure, 
we're talking about the force of blood that's leaving the heart. Mm -hmm. So when that heart contracts, it's taking a bigger space and making it smaller and it's pushing things out of it. When it's pushing things out of it, it's pushing it into an artery and it's increasing the pressure in that artery. And that's what that bigger number, that diastolic number, your blood pressure is. Mm -hmm. And then when it's not contracting is what that lower number is, that bottom okay. number is. So however many millimeters of mercury or whatever your measurement technique is for pressure, that's how much pressure you're putting on the wall of that okay. artery every time your heart beats. So obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but my guess there would be the higher the blood pressure, the more likely for a rupture, the more likely for damage along the way in various parts of the artery or even the heart itself. Exactly, okay. exactly. So, you know, long term... If my upper number is in 130, 140 pre-hypertensive or 140, 150 hypertensive range, I'm putting increased pressure on the wall of that artery. And over time, I'm stressing it. And right. just like anything that you're stressing over a long period of time, eventually, there's going to be some give to that. And you don't want your aorta to give way. Probably you're, not. You're yeah. probably not going to make it very long after that happens. Right. It's not part of the plan. No. Uh, Good. Okay. So that, I think that gives us a good baseline of what we might mean by uh, sort of basic fitness is uh, having uh, good cardiovascular health. Yeah. Um, now, as we extend that maybe to elite sport, that's there might be, as you kind of alluded to, not subjectivity because it's not just a matter of whatever you want fitness to be. It can be right. fit, right? I mean, the guy eating Twinkies uh, <laughs> on the corner and, and, you know, sitting on, you know, well, sitting on his butt, not doing anything. Um, can't say, well, I'm fit because it's just, you know, so subjectivity <laughs> isn't quite right. But it is, it does seem to be multifaceted, right? Certainly. Because, uh, you know, the athlete who needs to be able to, uh, you know, from a stopping point, be able to go full speed and then stop and then go again, or, you know, to be able to just constantly go if you're talking about something that's more um, uh, like, a, like running or, or a sustained, a kind of sustained right. thing, that they might have, uh, a need for, for a different kind of, of fitness. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, if you look at this from a perspective of, you know, let, let's keep it in the same gamut, I guess, for lack of a better term, and look at running. Okay. Look at short distance runner versus a long distance runner or even a middle distance runner. And you look, you can actually look across the spectrum of the distance that someone generally runs, especially competitively. Right. And there are different body types dramatically yeah. across that. What I might consider healthy or fit for a marathon runner is definitely very different than what I would consider fit and healthy for, you know, someone that's running short distances, mm -hmm. you know, short distance runners, they tend to be a bit bulkier. There's definitely going to be more musculature to them. Whereas because they need that big burst of they speed, they need that big burst of speed. They need larger muscles that can work what we call anaerobically without oxygen. Mm -hmm. So they're working more quickly. They're firing more rapidly. They need muscles that are going to be able to respond quickly and respond frequently, but for a short period of time. Compare that to somebody that is running a marathon and yeah, quick bursts of energy are great at first, but they yeah. taper off really quick. And when your body's working without oxygen and your muscles aren't using oxygen, it's not putting out as much energy uh, over the long term. It's actually putting out quite a bit less energy and this anaerobic exercise puts out byproducts called lactic acid, right. lactic acid buildup in your muscles that over the long term, causes fatigue. It causes muscle fatigue. When I'm running 26.2 miles, I don't want muscle fatigue setting in after the first half mile to right. a mile. So those individuals are using different muscles. They're using a different type of muscle, I should say. It's the same muscles. It's just designed differently and mm -hmm. built differently that it's allowing them to use oxygen. But those muscles aren't going to respond as quickly. They're not going to fire, fire and contract as frequently and as quick. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, they're going to be able to go a lot longer. So it's more so more, they can sustain itself for right. for a lot longer. It, it's a short burst of energy versus an endurance right. type thing. And in short distance running, you need that short rapid burst of energy that you can repeatedly do in a very short period of time to maximize your speed versus... Marathon running has as much to do with endurance right. as it does to do with speed. Yeah, oh, good. Okay, interesting. Now, um, 
so we're talking about the fitness. We talk about okay, well, what's gonna, what kind of cardiovascular health does a person need to be in in order to be able to run short bursts versus running long distance versus the average person as we're talking about a little bit, uh, which to some degree might be within within a, a range. Oh, right? certainly, yeah. Um, and you know what, what what the average person might require is probably less uh, to some degree. I mean, there's probably a base. Would you say that there's probably like a baseline in terms of what? Uh, would be fit for the average person uh, for that was going to cover most of the population. Yeah, I mean, you know, in general, when we look at things like, you know, to go back to cardiovascular health, when we look at heart rate, we're looking at, you know, average human being is somewhere between, average healthy human being, somewhere between about 60 to 80 beats per minute. So your okay. heart's beating just about once a second. Uh, blood pressure, you know, they say... You know, nowadays they've become more lax with this and they say, well, if you're around 120 is your high number for blood pressure, you're good. Well, technically that's still considered pre-hypertensive. It's just kind of the population as a whole, the okay. numbers have gone up. Realistically, you know, Kind of like great inflation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never experienced that. Yeah. You know, realistically, a number about 100 to 110, you know, that's an a good number for an average healthy human being. Now for a a really athletic individual and an elite athlete, we're looking much lower for the mm -hmm. most part. I mean, 60 to 80 beats per minute is high for an athlete. We're probably looking somewhere closer to 50 beats per minute, mm. in some cases down in the 40s for endurance wow. athletes as an average resting heart rate. Wow. Uh, blood pressure, high number, instead of looking around 120, we may be looking in the 90s. Mm. So you're looking at a very big difference. But these people... I don't mean these people as some off subset of the population that, you know, are odd, but people that are active frequently, frequently exercising, their body compensates for the needs that are mm -hmm. going along with this. So if you're active more often, your oxygen needs are going to be more. So you're going to have more red blood cells, which is the cells in your blood that carry oxygen around right. to the rest of your tissues. If you've got more red blood cells and you can carry oxygen better then when you're at rest... Your heart doesn't need to be pumping as often to get that oxygen through because you're more carrying efficient. more of it. Yeah, it's more efficient of a right. delivery system. So like why pump 60 to 80 times a minute when pumping 40 to 50 times a minute is doing the same exact thing? So am I in trouble? Because I think my uh, my resting heart rate is probably around 80 or a little bit higher. Nah, I mean, that, that's still normal. Okay. I mean, you know, Good. you're a okay. relatively active person. Yeah. Um, it, it also has as much to do with what you're doing athletically. I uh -huh. mean, we run into each other at the gym sometimes. Right. Uh, I'm on the treadmill for an hour while you're behind me for an hour working on the weights. Right. And, Not quite an hour. That's yeah. optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing more anaerobic exercises. Yeah. So you're doing more things that don't require oxygen. In fact, don't work. You're using muscles that don't work necessarily. I don't want to say well with oxygen, but that are ones that work without oxygen effectively. Okay. I'm using muscles when I'm running that require lots of oxygen. Right. So my resting heart rate, you know, on a day where I'm not grading or not lecturing <laughs> is somewhere probably around 48, Yeah, which is low, but I also am running you know, better than seven miles a day, five wow. days a week. So there's a good reason for that. Well, then that, that actually makes me uh, think of another th issue that I wanted to, to, to raise. So we've talked about cardiovascular health as a part of fitness. Um, but one, one issue that, and the reason why you're talking about running comes up is that, uh, you know, the running also comes with other problems. So mm -hmm. knees, ankles, the back, oh, yeah. uh, the damage, uh, from the, the impact of those. I mean, there's ways to, to assuage some of that, but, um, but that's there too. So I, how does that fit into some of these equations about, uh, you know, athletics and fitness if, some of what we're doing is increasing cardiovascular health, but if then if you're if you're damaging your joints, does that offset some of that? What do you think about some of those issues? Uh, it's a great question. I think for the average individual, someone who's not you know an elite athlete or isn't out running all the time or you know pushing themselves to the limit on a regular basis, the benefits of exercise are going to outweigh the benefits of joint preservation from not exercising because right. <laughs> as you put increased weight on you're going to be putting the same force 
on those joints just on a longer time scale. Well, I wasn't suggesting that you not exercise. No, no, but no. It I, may, but possibly, you know, um, instead of the treadmill, maybe the pre-core machine or instead of uh, um, even that, you know, swimming laps or, mm-hmm. um, you know, do, or instead of running, doing uh, uh, maybe just walking at a, at a faster rate so that the impact might be might be less. Right. So, I mean, is, is that something to, to take into account? Although I think I, I take your point of... Right. I mean, it, it's one thing if you're running a lot of those seven miles a day sounds like a lot. That no sounds what like you're a about. considerable <laughs> amount of, of, of running to me. So I don't know. I mean, not, not to make this about you. No, no. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in, you're, you're right. You know, different exercises for different people. And there certainly is this trade off of swimming laps in a pool, for example, like you were saying, where you're taking, you're not putting nearly as much pressure and stress on your joints mm-hmm. as you are when you're running. I mean, if you're, you know, a 200 pound person and you're running, every time you take a step, you're not bringing 200 pounds down on your knee. You're bringing 200 pounds times whatever the force you're going down towards the ground is with. So Uh it may be four times the weight of your body you're putting down on your knees every time. That's a lot of weight. That's a lot of weight. And long term, that's that's damage that's coming along with that. Now, there are ways to counterbalance that to some extent, um, you know, resting it properly, not messing around too much when you know you're sore, don't push yourself too hard, and strengthening the musculature around it so right. that you're spreading out some of that force or you're mm-hmm. using it in different ways. Our bodies are really well adapted for handling a lot of that damage. I mean, there are certainly lots of populations where, around the world for that matter, where you know, running is a part of everyday life mm-hmm. and we're moving like that as part of everyday life. And your, your knee is your back are well designed with lots of shock absorbers in them to handle right. that. Now there's a limit to that. And certainly we see this a lot in elite endurance athletes that later in life, there's going to be consequences. Right. If I'm training for a marathon and I'm not just training for one marathon, but that's what I do. Do. Right. And so you're running a couple marathons a year, maybe. I don't know. I don't right. even know what the average is for, for an elite <laughs> athlete. But I'm sure it's, it's more than one, I, I would imagine. Yeah, which I mean, is pretty considerable. There are some people, I, I've seen people that maybe run a marathon a month. Oh, that's insane. Um, <laughs> in 10 years, those people are going to have osteoarthritis and yeah. they're going to have joint issues, if not sooner. Their and then body doesn't get a rest. And then there's, um, you know, the, the super marathons, the super long distance stuff. Uh, you know, that's. Which the super, I don't, I mean, the distance is there. And then some of the distances that some of the bikers do yeah. comparable to the super long stuff that some of those do. It's that, that seems, um, at that point, and this, and, and that's part of what, uh, um, this discussion, uh, is, is interesting to me about because to some degree we're getting, those are athletes that are getting to the point where what they're doing isn't contributing to their health. No. And so it's disconnecting in a way the athletic pursuit from the pursuit of fitness or the pursuit of health. Um, you know, in, in the average person uh, or the average po- person in an average population, whatever, uh, however we want to refer, refer to that, the normal person on all these terms become, you know, tinged with PC-ness and stuff. <laughs> they have to worry about all that, right? But, you know, they're just the, the everyday kind of person. Um, they don't need to worry so much about that. And, and as I'm hearing what you're saying, and, and in part, if, uh, um, you know, let's say that, you know, there, there is a damage uh, to the knees and stuff, and you know you know that, and you take some of the precautions. But if you know that, look, if I'm on my if I'm on the pre-core machine, I'm just not going to do it. It's not as interesting. It's not as fun. I'm I prefer the pre-core, but I'm just sort of speaking in, the, in maybe right. your voice or someone else's voice. Or okay, look, yeah, swimming is great exercise. It's better for your joints, but I'm just not going to get in the pool and do the same amount of exercise that I'm going to get from going outside and running. And right. that there's a certain kind of of uh, of other kind of pleasure that one's getting either because it's outside or because of the the high that one's getting from just the, the running itself that is going to allow one to actually engage in the regular exercise where if they had to do something that they didn't enjoy as much, they'd be more likely not to do it. Would, right. Does that, that sound about right? And yeah, that, I mean, that's true even for me. I've been telling myself for the last six months, okay, it's time to slow down on the running and start getting on the weights a little bit. Yeah. And focus. Well, you're, also, you're getting too skinny, man. Yeah, well, I'm not trying to get any skinny. <laughs> if anything, I'm trying to get a little bit bigger. <laughs> and to do that, you've got to focus the exercise on certain areas. But I cannot bring myself to get on the weights because 
I just I enjoy the running and it's calming to me and it's relaxing to me. I don't like the mm-hmm. sitting in one place and I really just don't like the soreness that comes after lifting weights, to be perfectly okay. honest. Yeah. But yeah. as much of it is, you know, it's starting to get warm out and I like to get outside and do exercise in the sun. And right. I mean, I'm sure skin cancer will kill me instead someday because I like... <laughs> Not here. Fun. We don't get enough sun. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> when you lived in Florida. It's true. This isn't Florida anymore. <laughs> but um, but to each their own. And right. how you get your exercise depends on the individual, definitely. Right. And as you were saying before, that it seems more important to make sure that you're getting the regular exercise. Um you know, it, it being safe about it mm-hmm. and looking, making sure that, you know, uh, you know, you check with your physician and or your health professional and making sure that there aren't reasons why you shouldn't be doing one exercise or another. Right. If you're running into regular, regular problems, all chronic issues or something like that. But that by and large, for the most part, you're better off getting out there and doing some, some kind of exercise. Um, uh, so, but then when we get getting back to the elite athlete. So, I mean, to, want, to some degree, some of the athletics that they're involved in uh, themselves don't seem to really contribute directly to, to their fitness, right? So some of the harms that we're talking about. Right. But then also, uh, what about the training regimen, right? So, uh, I don't, you know, the, 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 elite, the kind of training, not just in terms of the exercise, but maybe also the kind of diet and nutritional requirements that go along with that kind of elite exercise regimen. Uh, there's things about that, that that seem to... to to seem unhealthy to me to some degree. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. I, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, on both ends, from the dietary perspective as well as the physical activity perspective, I'd never recommend, and you know, I'm not a nutritionist, a dietitian, or a physician. My area of expertise <laughs> is biology in general. But I'd never expect an a- average individual to get out there and do the type of training that elite athletes do uh, for their respective sports, especially professional athletes. Um, dietary wise, whether or not it's a balanced diet, there's a lot of supplementation that's usually going on to make sure you have certain things or enough of certain things. Uh, I was reading this past summer, you know, with Olympic fever going on. Michael Phelps, when he's training, eats something like 5,000 calories for right. breakfast. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you even do that short do of like having it? like 10 Big Macs or something? Yeah. I mean, an <laughs> average human being is supposed to eat, you know, an average adult male should be eating 5,000 calories every two and a half days. Right. So what this man eats for breakfast and lunch, an average person eats in a week. Yeah. Um, that's not good. That can't be good. That, that can't. can't that, be that's got to be taxing your liver, then yeah, your stomach, and your kidneys. Yeah, that's taxing your liver. It's kidneys. taxing your kidneys. It's taxing your stomach. The heavy, crazy amount of exercise that these people are doing to burn those calories is putting a massive strain yeah. on your kidneys. I mean, as you're, I mean, let's be perfectly honest. From a biological perspective, the reason you put muscle mass on when you exercise and when you work your muscles isn't because you're making them bigger necessarily in a good way. And I'm not saying that exercising this way is bad, but your body is responding to you creating micro tears in your muscles because they can't handle the force you're trying to put on them. And so you've got to build up additional protein in those muscles to aid in that process. So your body's responding to something it can't do, trying to make itself be able to do that. Right, and that's the point in weightlifting, right? You you bring your muscle to fatigue. Right. So the muscle literally can't, you can't move the weight anymore. I mean, if ideally, this is what you, I, I right. rarely do this, cause, but <laughs> this is what I should be doing, right? Is, is, you know, you do a sufficient amount of weight that with a sufficient amount of reps, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you're, you fatigue the muscle out and the muscle basically dies on you. To, not completely so that you just becomes jelly, but it can't move the muscle anymore. It can't move the weight or it can't, it can't, uh, let's say try to be technical. It can't really project any more force. Right. It can't exert the force yeah. necessary to do what you're trying to make it do. And so then that sends some signal somewhere along the lines to, to, right. you know, basically like, red alert, we need more muscle. Right. And you start, <laughs> you start releasing certain enzymes and hormones and proteins that cause it to start building up. Uh, increasing in size, going through what we call hypertrophy, mm-hmm. in maximizing increasing size, but it's tissue damage. Right. And so when you have tissue damage... That's why you're sore. You're, that's why you're sore. And your body has byproducts of damage, toxins and whatnot that it's got to deal with. And your liver and your kidneys are right. principally dealing with those things. Now, for you or me going and working out in the gym, no, we're not putting massive amounts of toxins when we're working out. But for someone who's a bodybuilder or a weightlifter who is 
maximizing the size, literally maximizing the size of their muscles to where their skin can't even really much hold yeah. it anymore. Yeah, they're putting a massive tax on their liver and their kidneys. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't have any sort of numbers or long-term studies, but I would imagine later in life, these people, in addition to your joint issues, are going to have liver and kidney issues later right. on in life as well. Mm-hmm. There's only so much garbage you can put into a part of your body be- to clean out before it says, hey, I'm done. Right. Uh, and it gets overloaded and damaged. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, so the training regimens for the elite athletes seem uh, – and the, and the reason why I bring this up is, you know, one of the issues that I w- want to get to in a little, in just a couple minutes is the issue of doping, right? right? And, and some of the health effects that are going to come from that. But, you know, it does seem that to some degree, this is another issue. Like one of the, one of the, some people might say, oh, well, professional athletes, whatever adults they are uh, to make a choice, right? The effect that that's going to have down on kids to use performance enhancing drugs of some sort is going to be big. Oh, I want to be uh, like A-Rod and A-Rod juices right we can say that now right we can say that okay <laughs> we probably could have said that a long time ago. well too, yes but. i know but i'm you know i'm partly i'm saying Even that because you're an alumni of the university of miami and a yankees fan yeah <laughs> so it gives me drinking water there <laughs> gives me good pleasure to uh to rib you on that but um you know, and so that, oh, well, you know, uh, some kid might, might want to use performance enhanced drugs because he sees his athlete. Now, whatever validity we might want to give to that argument, uh, it, it seems equally uh, applicable uh, to questions of their, of their, of their regimen, uh, mm. their training regimen, their diet regimen. And so, you know, the, those same kinds of issues would come up, I, I think, for that. So if, if one is trying to make the case that we ought to ban these drugs, performance enhancing drugs or doping, primarily on the basis of the sort of role model effect uh, that raises a, a slippery slope to the rest of the things that they do in the sport. Um, yeah. So that, that's, I just want to, we're not, I don't really want to get into, into that particular argument, but that's partly why I kind of wanted to, to raise, raise that issue. Now, one interesting thing um, uh, that I saw just, uh, just recently, I, I tweeted it out uh, this morning, um, was a, uh, a New York Times article about Spelman College I don't know if you saw this. Spelman no, I College, um, I think, is in the south somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and it recently, uh, or it's going through the process of dropping its athletic department um, and leaving the NCAA and getting rid of intercollegiate sports. Hmm. And, to, and then taking the money that they had been using for that and put it a, into building up broader fitness programs. Just, you know, having one of the things they were talking about then there is a sort of a 5K for all the students to run in and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, primarily, it, from the article at least, it seemed like this was a financial decision. It's a small school. Yeah. It's a Division three. They had something, uh, I think the, the, the articles mentioned they had 80 or 90 student athletes with, you know, and then a budget of, you know, a million dollars or something like that going into intercollegiate sports. And so looking at that, it seems like a bit imbalanced. It's a lot of money going to a small subset. And it's a lot of money going out that's not – it's not a big D1 program, so it's not bringing money back in from alumni and ticket sales and merchandising, etc. Right. So it's – to to a large degree, it's a financial decision. But also the the president of the school mentioned uh, that they had um, uh, a significant number of their alumni uh, have all kinds of – of health-related problems, mm-hmm. diabetes, stuff that's related to not being fit, as we've been talking about. Um, and, and so as you mentioned, even kind of really kind of uh, the, the, sad, the, the, the sad effect of going to the 10-year reunion and all having all these memorials for people who had died. Mm. And, I mean, 10-year reunion, you're talking about yeah. people that are in their 30s. Right. That's really scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and... You know, and so some of it was, it's not just, a, well, okay, we can't afford this anymore. It was more of like, uh, it seemed to me more of a question of, is this, the? It, it seemed to raise the question, are athletics a good way to stay fit, broad, more broadly speaking? If we want to encourage fitness in the population, are athletics the way to do it, or are these other fitness programs? So, uh, you know, one, uh, it'd be interesting to see if this, I know, uh, you know, one or two other schools have, have done something like this. So it'd be interesting to see what kind of trend this has. What do you what do you think about this? Yeah, you know, I the the concept as a whole of you know dropping an athletic program or whatever that's you know neither here nor there to me. The concept of rediverting the money towards promoting fitness in the mm-hmm. population as a whole that 
we're not just focusing on the fitness of a small subset of our population right and looking at well this is what the athletes look like so this is what we should all aspire to and this is what we should all try to be no average person sitting on the couch is going to turn around and well most average people on the couch maybe someone will but the average person is not going to turn around and say yeah you know what i should be doing exactly what they're doing and Mm -hmm. working the same way they are and there's not the inspiration maybe an aspiration but mm-hmm. there's not the inspiration to do it because there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, right. I remember as an undergraduate, I wanted nothing to do with the type of athleticism that the athletes on campus were putting forth, where they were putting hours and hours a day into practice and right. hours and hours a week into the gym. I didn't have time for that. Right. Now, re-diverting that money to promoting a general fitness regime of generally improving your health by getting active and doing something rather than nothing. Yeah. I think that's laudable. Uh whether in this case it's got really as much to do with that or is it we need to cut this because it's too much money and let's put a good spin on it. Yeah. Uh and hey, by all means if they're just trying to put a good spin on it but it has good benefits in the long run, yeah. I'm all for it. Yeah. But you're right. Promoting athleticism versus promoting fitness is definitely two different things. And I think too often in society, and before I get on a soapbox and a tangent here, <laughs> um, we look to our elite athletes as what we should be doing or what we should strive for rather than looking to an average individual who's improved their health or improved their life and something maybe that's more attainable. Like, right. I can do that. I can't look like Adrian Peterson, right. but I can look like the guy who's maybe jogging a couple of miles a day down the street and has taken off a few pounds and is generally happier and healthier than he was before. Yeah. Well, and that, that's good that you mentioned that too, because, you know, there, it's not just, you know, get back to this issue of fitness, right? I mean, cause there's, uh, there's mental fitness oh, as yeah. well. And, and the psychological effects of, of dropping the weight of not having the weight or just working out in general before you get the endorphin release, uh, that that seems to be uh, part of this concept of fitness as well, the psychological aspect. Definitely. And, and at the same time, you know, on that same mental fitness and mental health that goes along with fitness, the concept of what you're trying to achieve, uh, if what you're trying to achieve is having the body of an elite athlete, you're very quickly going to become dejected. Yeah. And you're very quickly probably going to give up or at least get down on yourself. Um, whereas if the goals that society is setting for you or that you're seeing in, in the public eye are more attainable, and I'm not saying, you know, attainable meaning lose five pounds and you're still horrendously overweight, right. but yeah, being, it depends on where you're starting from, right? right depends yeah. on where you're starting from, but being generally healthier and more active, if that's the goal that you're seeing and that's attainable, then yeah, when you lose 50, 60 pounds and you've still got some extra skin or some extra weight in places, maybe you're not so dejected by that. I've put all this effort in and look, nothing came of it. Right. You're realizing how much better off you are for what you've done. Yeah. And so you don't get this yo-yo effect of, well, I'll just go back to where I was before and then eventually I get so damn miserable again that I need to do it all over again. Right. That doesn't seem healthy either. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> well, so you, you raise an interesting question that I think is a good segue into one of the other things I wanted to talk about because you say, well, if you you hold up the elite athlete as your model, you're gonna be you're you're gonna you're not gonna be successful for the most part. Now, some part of that is because the elite athlete, you know, talk about Michael Phelps. They have they not that they have been, but they are in euphemistically speaking, been genetically designed to be that that kind of athlete. Yeah, uh, without and, a doubt. And so, most of the average person, the reason why you're not an elite athlete is because you didn't have the gene uh, distribution to to allow you to do that, or if you did, you you know you just maybe you didn't take advantage of it. But um, and there are certainly are probably people, you know, some somebody working, you know, in a mill somewhere who could be, you know, the best uh, shot putter in the world. But you know, whatever. Um, uh, which reminds me of this Onion article about uh, a violin violinist prodigy who never played the violin and dies or something like that. Right? <laughs> She would have been the best had she had she uh, had she uh, played, but so um, could could you speak a little bit to to the effect of or talk about some of the the the, the role of genes in some of this uh, process? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, look, genetics, and I I don't want to make a blanket <coughs> statement that genetics <coughs> excuse me does not affect things, but 
in general, genetic, poor genetics, whatever genetics you're dealt with is not an excuse to be overweight and sitting on the couch because, well, I just can't do it because I have bad genes. Now, there are certainly genetic conditions that result in whatever situation similar to that. But by the opposite end of the spectrum, quote unquote, good genes mm -hmm. certainly have a lot to do with elite athleticism. Um, I was watching again over the summer or something, and it was of course Michael Phelps because that's what the summer was built around. Right about Michael Phelps's physical stature yeah. and his physical dimensions being so out of sorts compared to what an average human being's physical dimensions were. You know, the size of his arms relative to his body, right. the it's size of chest his, his the chest, size. the size of his feet relative yeah. to his legs. That basically, if you really got down to it, what they were saying is he's an awkward, lanky, really strangely proportioned individual who's a perfect fish. Yeah. That when he's in the water, his feet basically act like flippers. His arms act like oars. And there's a reason that an average person can't swim like that. It's because he has a genetic advantage. Right. Um, you know, from back to the perspective of muscles, we have different types of muscle that make up our physical muscles. We've got what we call slow twitch versus fast twitch muscle. We've got anaerobic muscle that works in areas where it doesn't use a lot of oxygen, but it can mm -hmm. work really quickly and really effectively for a short period of time versus muscle that doesn't work quite as quickly and quite as effectively, but uses more oxygen. The proportion of those different types of muscles to a very large extent is genetic. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that you don't see people transition from being short track runners to marathon runners. It's because genetically their bodies really can't do it. Mm -hmm. They can't switch that type of muscle to the other type of muscle that predisposes them towards one way or the other. And certainly elite athletes are going to be, by and large, not universally, but by and large the individuals among us who have a genetic predisposition towards a certain type of muscular or certain body dimensions or certain attributes mm -hmm. that make them more inclined to be good at what they do. It's, it's no accident that, you know, when you and I were growing up, we saw a lot of great athletes, particularly in baseball and football. And now we're starting to see some of their kids come up and play. Mm -hmm. um, there's no accident to that. There's good genes that go along no. with it. Now there's also, and I don't mean to insult any of them, but in general, from what I've seen in sports, there's probably also a parent in the background who's pushing them right. to do. Well, yeah, I mean the, the nature nurture argument is right. is perennial, and and there's there's some of some of that that's going on that, uh, you know, they're told, you know, your dad, you know, you want to be like your dad or whatever, and so they they're out there from a young age watching what their dad does, playing what their dad uh, plays, and um, emulating them, and so. Uh, whatever genetic disposition they have, they build on it and stretch Certainly, it. Without a doubt. Uh, and similarly with Michael Phelps, right? I mean, he might be the gen perfect genetic specimen for swimming, but if he had never stepped in the pool, and that's that's why, I, right. you know, going back to the 90-year-old violinist who passed away without ever playing a violin, um, you know, if he had never stepped in the pool, he wouldn't be an Olympic He'd swimmer. He'd be an awkward, lanky businessman right. somewhere. Right, or if he if he never had swum, it swam, Swam never had swam until you know he was in his twenties. It would have been too late, right? You know that um, we we I don't think you you want to be saying that, or I, I don't take you to be saying that it's merely genetics. That genetics no, is the not destiny. In the that, least. that even with that great body that he has for swimming, he still has to train a tremendous yeah. amount to be not just to be in the shape, but to be able to do what he does. Yeah. He, he's got to train enough to burn five thousand plus right. calories from breakfast exactly. to be able to pull off what he pulls off. And there are certainly other swimmers that don't have the same physical proportions as him who are almost as good as right. him at the same point. You know, it's not all genetics, but right. genetics certainly plays a role. And there's certainly like you said, he if he started in his twenties, I don't care how hard he trained, he wasn't gonna get to the point he was he was at by the time he was eighteen, nineteen, twenty, because yeah. you start to pass your prime, so right. to speak. I mean, I mean, you do hear that sometimes, particularly uh, um, with uh, NFL. You have someone who's maybe their junior year in college, and they've never played football before, and they get recruited to the football team, and they play, and then they go pro, and you know, it's, so they. Um, th I mean, th those are the exception. Yeah. But you hear you hear about that. You, but it's it's not as if those were guys who were just sitting around playing PlayStation. No, exactly. They were they were stars in other sports, just sports that had no professional tracks to them. Right. Yeah. The the guy did not turn around and get off the couch one day and pick up a football and start throwing it eighty yards down the field exactly. accurately. He right. was doing something else. Yeah. Um. 
So uh, it, this this then raises the question, or shifts has a shift the the, the discussion to uh, uh, what's been called gene doping, right, or genetic manipulation mm-hmm. uh, and things like that. So um, maybe you could, and I know you cover this later in, in your class, uh, or at least I saw it in your syllabus. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> The uh, maybe you could say a little bit about what gene doping might consist in, right? I mean, essentially, it varies, but gene doping is basically in some way altering, I maybe not necessarily altering the genetic makeup because it's not necessarily changing out your genes, but mm-hmm. supplementing genes or altering things in some way that all of our genes in our body code for proteins ultimately. So, if we can somehow change the proteins they're coding for or change the form of the protein they're coding for, or increase the amount of a protein that they're coding for, we can alter whatever that protein's associated with. So if we can cause our body to make more of the proteins associated with muscle mass, Mm -hmm. actin and myosin, then maybe we can create an individual who's more muscular. muscular. And they've certainly done this in, uh, in a couple of different animal models in mice in particular we get these giant muscular mice when they turn off certain genes Mm -hmm. and they've seen this in people that have had genetic disorders where Mm -hmm. a certain protein isn't produced that limits the amount of muscle we get you know toddlers that can lift enormous amounts of weight because they have really massive muscles uh if you can somehow turn make an extra copy of a gene that's associated with producing uh, erythropoietin, which we more commonly call in sports EPO. Okay. EPO is what's responsible for producing new red blood cells in your body. So now if instead of injecting EPO to do to increase the amount of red blood cells, you're actually genetically modifying a person, put an extra copy of the gene in there that makes EPO. Right. Well, you've done the same thing without actually injecting it into the body. You've made more of it by altering the genes that are involved in okay. it. Okay. So, so you're not taking a substance. You're not uh, um, uh, supplementing your diet in some way to do it. It's, you're doing it at a much more basic level. Right. A, a, lot of thing, a lot of what it is is when we genetically modify things, it's usually that we insert a virus in there that mm-hmm. is not going to cause an illness but does what a virus does. It inserts genetic information into your cells. Right. Well, we tell it what genetic information to put in the cells. We give it a copy of the genetic information we want it to put in the cells. And so we can get it to put in whatever we want in there right. and potentially cause a change. Um, now, what the long-term ramifications of that are, that's far from been studied enough in any way, right. shape, or form. But it's certainly possible that I can turn around and say, yeah, I want this gene to be expressed twice as much or... The version of the gene I have isn't ideally ideal for what I want to do, so let's insert another version of the gene and get this virus to do it for me right. that's only going to target one particular area of the body. You know, erythropoietin is made in my kidneys, so if I can get a virus that's only going to target cells in the kidney and get it to insert a second copy of the gene for EPO, well, now I've just increased the amount of EPO my body's producing, and I've mm-hmm. increased the amount of red blood cells I have. Increased the amount of oxygen I can now carry. Right. Increased my endurance as a result. All right. Although uh, now, um, it does seem though you, you, one of the um, <laughs> kind of spun out there. That, <laughs> <laughs> well, I got, I got a couple different ideas that are, that are thrown out here. So I mean, one is you know just doing that isn't going to turn you into Lance Armstrong. No. Right. Uh, and because you, you you still have to train, you still got to direct the rest of your body systems to be able to handle that, to be able to make use of the extra blood cells, right? Right, certainly, without a doubt. Uh, I, I think the question in that case comes down to not, is it going to turn you into Lance Armstrong, but does it give Lance Armstrong an unfair advantage if he's increasing his red blood cells versus everyone else who's training just as hard as him and working just as hard, but isn't? Increasing right. their number of red blood cells. Well, it's interesting because uh, you know, separate from uh, the particular issue of Lance Armstrong, which for a while he was held up uh, as as the poster boy for 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 this example. Now, uh, with his more recent uh, confessions, not so much. But I mean, there is natural genetic variation in the population, without a doubt. And so, certainly, 
you know, probably all of those elite athletes, to, not maybe not all, that's, that's too big, but, you know, a good chunk of those elite athletes probably already have, to some degree, uh, genetic variation that leads to increased EPO production in them anyway. Is, do you think that's a reasonable assumption? Or something of some form, re- depending on what the particular sure. genetic variant variation is related to the particular trait that that individual is using. Yeah, and I've discussed this in my course of if I've got indiv- two individuals and they're both training just as hard, one is going to be better than the other, all things considered in all likelihood. And what it may very well come down to is a version of a gene that this one has, that this one doesn't have. Right. There's a big genetic underpinning. And so a lot of work goes into how can we screw with that genetic underpinning yeah. to achieve what we want. You know, a lot of genetic modification uh, and what we now call GMO technology, genetically modified organisms, changing the genes that an organism has or enhancing them or altering them in some way. A lot of it started out both from a, you know, agricultural and commercial sure. point of view, but as much of a medical point of view. Sure. If we can alter this gene, can we cure cystic fibrosis, right. for example? Uh, just or Parkinson's. Or Parkinson's or, or, or muscular yeah. dystrophy. Uh, the dystrophin gene, and if this is turned on or off, and what type of form of the dystrophin gene you have indicates whether you're a normal individual or you have an illness like muscular dystrophy. Well, could we alter that in some way? Just like anything, there's going to be a, okay, but now what What advantage or what yeah. edge can I gain by doing the same type of thing in a different Right, way? so the, sort of the distinction between therapy and enhancement. So yes. Sort of, um, we can use a lot of these technologies and, you know, medical, you know, just the, the broad set of technologies here that we're talking about to take people that have certain kinds of disabilities or are prone to certain diseases or, to, you know, parts of that somehow it's, it's an unhealthy situation and we can bring them up to some sort of within the range of a norm uh, or we can go beyond that. Right. Right. And. Uh, you know, and I think also, and that's that's perfectly relevant as well, just in terms of sports and and doping in sports in general. Whether we're talking about uh, genetic doping or we're talking about just your, you know your standard straightforward mm-hmm. steroid HGH type doping, is that uh, it does seem that many of the athletes some are using it as an enhancer in the sense of okay, I'm at I'm at a certain level. If I take this, I'll, I can increase that level. Uh, but some might also be doing it to be because of, of injury or just uh, you know, the fatigue aspect of having played for a while. So you have some of the older players that maybe never used any kind of PDs in their career, but they get towards the twilight of their career. They're getting injured faster, taking longer to get back. The therapeutic use there might mm-hmm. might be relevant, and that might be relevant for, uh, you know, to pick on you again, uh, Andy Pettit, right? Right. Um, that uh, it seems like that's, yeah, you know, if I can find the Yankees, uh, <laughs> uh, that 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 seems to be part of, of his justification uh, or, right. um, you know, or, or a more cynical person might say rationalization. But, but I, you know, I, I think maybe he, a little of both. There. Yeah. <laughs> but that there is, there, there's an interesting thing there because I think people, some people might be more willing to accept the therapeutic uses of these various kinds of substances and, or, or technologies to include gene doping to uh, um, bring someone with, you know, either back from injury quicker or just some other therapeutic use versus someone who's otherwise, you know, fine and just using it to, to get to that extra level. Right. So we, I, you raise a very interesting point and in something that I've thought about myself quite a bit in that general populace, you know, if I injure my knee and I go to the doctor and it's taking a long time to heal, the doctor may be inclined to treat it with some sort of steroid or some other treatment that would be something that might yeah yeah, something that might improve it more rapidly um why not uh if there's a legitimate therapeutic reason to it now i realize that potentially creates an entire slippery slope in in, uh professional sports of in every individual suddenly becomes injured and they're all going to the same doctor who's willing to give them whatever they want to heal up uh or to ignore the pain and not feel the pain or whatever it may be. I mean, you know, painkillers could as much be performance enhancers as anything by allowing someone to carry out their athletic. Ab- absolutely. Endeavors. I mean, that's, that could be a whole show in itself. So what do we mean by a performance enhancer? Right. And it's something that when I do it in my sports ethics class, you know, we talk about that and I throw those things out and some of the students, you know, particularly the student athletes that, you know, get probably get lectured on this stuff by the, you know, whatever uh, kind of requirements that, 
the uh, whether it's at the high school or whether it's at college level, what kind of requirements does they have to be? Prof- I'm sure that there's some kind of educational program that goes on about doping. And stuff. Oh, I would imagine there's. Got and to be. so they get lectured on it, and, and I doubt that they bring up questions like ibuprofen is a performance enhancer. Right. Uh, the kinds of shoes that you might use as a marathoner can be a performance enhancer. Right. Uh, anything that well, enhances your performance, your capacity to be able to perform is going to be a performance enhancer. Right. So one of the questions that, that I really focus on when we talk about this unit uh, in class is we seem to have uh, two classes here. We have stuff that we have no problem with that enhances people's – I mean just training, going to the gym – is a performance enhancer, right. right? I mean, spending the time in the gym with the trainer to, you know, work on your uh, work on the strength in, in in your lower body, and then working in the batting cages. All of that is done to enhance your performance, without right? a doubt. Right? No one bats an eye at that, nor do I think they should. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it can't merely be. And then we have this whole other class of stuff that no, that's for both. Can't can't do that. Uh, and the interesting thing in sports ethics and in philosophy sport and other fields as well that look at this is wh- where do we draw the line and why? Because we don't want to be, well, at least from a philosophic perspective, uh, we don't want to draw it arbitrarily. No. Right? And just say, well, th- okay, just that stuff and not that. Right? And and to some degree in the history of sport, it is arbitrary mm-hmm. because it's it's reactive. Most of the sports are just reacting to what's out there and there isn't necessarily a clear principle about why we're banning them. Right. And that, and that raises – that issue is why are we banning them? Is it merely safety or is it something else? All right. Cause um, now one of the things I know that you get into in your class are the, the, some of the long-term health risks associated with steroids. Um, I don't know if you talk about HGH and some of the other EPOs type stuff, the other kinds of things that are classified usually as the prohibited kinds of right. PEDs. Um, you know, we don't have the time to get in, in into those. Um, certainly there are long-term health risks associated with them. I mean, there's, there's probably all kinds of questions about to what extent. Certainly, yeah. what are the risks? You know, there's uh, one of my favorite phrases. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, the dose makes the poison, right? right? And, I, and I think there's a real possibility. Maybe you can speak to this more because it's more your area of expertise. That it's quite possible that there is an effect, uh, an effective dose that's still low enough to uh, reduce at least significantly some of those long-term health risks so that having some sort of still very low effective dose for performance enhancing whether you're talking about steroids or hgh that there might be or some other kind of drug a monitored uh uh, uh dosage given to an athlete to perform to, to enhance their performance but that is given at such a low dosage that it's not going to have those long-term health effects or done in a way that reduces some of that. I mean, you're not going to reduce it to zero, but you're engaging in a dangerous activity to begin with. So, <laughs> so uh, I mean, what, it, it is, is that an unreasonable uh, assumption that I'm making there in terms of steroids? Um, that's definitely a case, not case by case, a substance by substance. Abs- uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, depend- and to some degree, probably even person to person, because right. some people are going to have contraindications that, look, you know, if you take this steroid, you know, for the genetic makeup, you're going to be more likely to develop certain kinds of responses versus others that might not develop those. Right. And, I mean, the human body works on negative feedback. Things get out of whack of where the level of something is supposed to be, and your body modifies to bring that level back for most things in the body. So if you increase the amount of testosterone you're putting in your body, for example, most steroids are testosterone or synthetic derivatives – of it, uh, your body is going to reduce your natural production right. of it as a result. Which is why you have to take a female uh, reproductive hormone, right? right. And this is why you know <laughs> you, you when people go on, you know, when people start injecting testosterone-based steroids, they cycle them because mm-hmm. you don't want to permanently shut down your body's production of it. it right. It's it's no accident that the testicles shrink up when people use stero- people use testosterone. That's where testosterone's made. It starts mm-hmm. making less of it as a result. Uh, so in certain cases, there may be you know, a specific dose or a dose-specific treatment that could potentially enhance athletic ability or have a performance-enhancing effect without having a long-term health effect. But at the same time, if they can find that and then it's okay and everyone's doing it, then what was the real benefit of doing it in the first place? Sure, sure. Um, well, and then and then even then, if, if you sort of restrict and say, okay, well, we'll allow it within this zone, you're still going to have people going to go beyond that. Right. And so you're still going to need some kind of policing of it. 
but it, there's been some suggestion that it, uh, you know, and kind of just the general general argument that might be uh, regarded about various kinds of things, that just the drug war in general versus just in sports, that uh, to some degree maybe more uh, all, uh, a more liberal regime where you allow it, but it's all transparent and you're able to sort of uh, monitor the, the amount that people are using. Because it, it seems to me that uh, that if safety here in terms of the leaks banning the drugs is the primary concern. I'm not sure banning is necessarily the best way to do it. It might there might be other ways to 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 allow it, but have it monitored in some way, or just you know that there's the concern about having high levels of testosterone might be um, you know a matter of of just you know saying okay, well an amount above this right that your T above this or relative to to the person or something like that is what's dangerous. However, you get there. Uh, we don't care, and that's <laughs> that, right? If it's synthetic, if it's natural in some way from your own genetic makeup or whatever, I mean, then also testosterone is also socially relevant too, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you're, you know, if if a couple of young women walked in here, I'm, I'm sure our testosterone level just naturally goes up, right? Um, you know, nothing... Yeah, nothing bad, right? But it just, it's just, just right. Am I, am I right in that? Yeah, there's, yeah. They, they, there's situational and population variation. Yeah. In it without a doubt. Sure. Um, Mine would go up a lot more because I'm more of a man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but uh, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, we're, we're kind of running out of, of time here. This is kind of you know it's an interesting topic, and of course it's a perennial topic. And without a you doubt. know it may be that. Uh, bring you back to talk more specifically just about some PED stuff or just about um, genetic modification. There's a lot of interesting issues that, that get raised by, by gene doping and, and why we ban them and, and so on. But uh, this, is, this has been, uh, been interesting. Um, so thanks for joining me, Sean. Thanks for having me. I'd love to come back and you know chat about this some more or something else altogether. Why uh-huh. not? Well, we, can, we can talk about the superiority of the Red Sox over the Yankees. Let, let's not get into that, <laughs> especially this season. <laughs> All right, before we close out uh, the show today, I did want to remind listeners that the second annual Rockford College Sports Studies Symposium is Friday, April 19th at 1 o'clock at Rockford College campus in the Grace Roper Lounge. Uh, Starting at 1 o'clock, we have uh, one panel on fandom talking about various issues uh, in fan sports. Uh, And then panel two, which will start at 3 o'clock, is going to focus on issues in fantasy and and play. So things like fantasy sports and worldwide wrestling uh, is going to be the the focus there. So I hope you can come out and and join us 1 o'clock on Friday. Thank you for listening. Uh, and you can find more information about the show, about the conference, uh, at thesportsethicist.com. You can also follow us on Twitter uh, and like us on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today.